Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our second panel, The Next Big Thing, Prospects for Growth in 2014. Our moderator, David Rubenstein, the Carlisle Group. He's joined by panelists Emilio Lazoya, CEO Pemex, Liko Dangodi, Chairman of Dangodi Group, Robert Wolf, Founder and CEO, 32 Advisors, and David Wessel, Director, Hutchins Center for Fiscal and Monetary Policy, the Brookings Institution. Okay, can everybody please take their seats? Everybody please take their seats, close the doors, turn off your cell phones, everything else. Everything you need to know about the world you're gonna learn in the next one hour, okay? Okay, let me give a little uh, fuller introduction to the people on our panel, and from my immediate left, Emilio Lozoya is the CEO of Pemex, which is the Mexican government-owned um, oil company, energy company. He is the youngest person ever to have that job. At the age of 38, he became the, the head of Pemex, and uh, he is a graduate of the Kennedy School at Harvard, and he is also somebody who's had his own private equity business, the highest calling of mankind in my view. He's <laughs> given that up for a temporary period of time, I guess, at Pemex, but hopefully he'll come back to this highest calling, I hope. In any event, um, he also has been at the IFC and worked in Washington, D.C., and he's been in charge for the World Economic Forum of Latin America and was a young global leader of the World Economic Forum. So next is Aliko Dangoti. He is um, one of the best-known businessmen in the world, uh, widely regarded as the wealthiest African businessman. Um, Time magazine came out today and said of the, uh, he is one of the 100 most influential people in the world and by far the most influential business person in Africa. The story about him was written by Bill Gates, who praised uh, Mr. Gendigoti for not just for his extraordinary business uh, successes in Nigeria and throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, but for his commitment to the eradication of polio in Nigeria and to malaria uh, eradication as well, and to the other things he's done for health-related uh, uh, causes in Africa. His business is primarily in cement, food, logistics, and it expands throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, Robert Wolf. Robert Wolf uh, is a person who is known to many people as President Obama's best friend in the financial services world. He was an early supporter of and very close friend of President Obama's, but he was at the time the global head of, U uh, the, the head of UBS in the Americas, previously been the global head of uh, trading and credit for, for UBS. Um, had a long career on Wall Street, had been at Salomon Brothers for 10 years before he went to UBS and rose up at UBS to be ultimately the head of the uh, Americas for UBS. Uh, now has 32 advisors, which is a cross-border advisory firm. Uh, in his background, he was also a star football player at the University of Pennsylvania, wore the number 32, and that's why it's 32 advisors. And, <laughs> uh, and Penn, under his uh, fullback leadership, um, won two Ivy League championships, right? Yeah. Okay, and David Wessel is well known to many people around the world for his uh, journalism uh, career. He won, uh, shared in two uh, Pulitzer Prizes, one at the Boston Globe and one at the Wall Street Journal. For 30 years he was at the Wall Street Journal and was the economics editor at the Wall Street Journal most recently and a columnist of the Capital Column. Uh, now he is heading the Hutchins Center for Fiscal and Monetary Policy at Brookings Institution. So, a very distinguished panel. So let's start, uh, well, my, on my immediate uh, left, let's start with uh, Mr. Lozoyo. Uh, perhaps you could tell us why it is that all of a sudden, after 75 years, uh, Pemex is now going to be deregulated. Uh, the government of Mexico has controlled oil and energy in Mexico, and now there's deregulation. And why is that a good thing for Mexico, and why is it a good thing for the rest of the world? Thank you very much, uh, David. First of all, I would like to thank Exim Bank for, for this invitation. Uh, Exim Bank is a trusted partner of Pemex. Uh, we are Exim Bank's largest client, and Exim Bank is uh, our largest uh, financier, and uh, we thank them very much for the business that we carry out with them and for this invitation. And indeed, David, uh, Mexico is changing. Uh, Mexico has deregulated not only the industry in terms of energy, but it has uh, carried out in the last 16 months more than 16 key structural reforms. Uh, all of these reforms were focused with, with one big aim, which is to affect those uh, areas that dampen productivity growth. Productivity growth in Mexico was stagnant basically for the last 30 years. Therefore, we had 
the economy growing, but not at, at its fullest potential. In the case of energy, we faced a paradox. Very abundant energy reserves, but very high energy costs. Vis-a-vis -vis the United States, our largest trading partner, we face upward of 50% of increased electricity costs. Uh, so our, our firms were less competitive. So um, the president uh, decided, as a campaign pro uh, promise back then, and delivered on it, to change the constitution. And basically, it is the most important reform in the last decades. Uh, Pemex is the largest company in Mexico. We invest about 25, 25 billion a year in exploration and production. And as a result of this reform, we expect investment to increase to about 50 to 60 billion a year over the next years. What impact it will have on GDP growth? We are sure that just the uh, inefficiencies that will be uh, affected throughout uh, the process and the increased investment will bring uh, GDP growth rates towards the 5% in a couple of years. So I assume everybody asks you uh, this question. What's the price of oil gonna be next year? Can you tell us? You're the private equity guy, so you will know. <laughs> well, give me a guess. Nobody knows. Well, the reality is that mega projects are becoming more and more difficult, more costly. The industry as a whole is facing an escalation of cost, and that means that every barrel or every unit of gas or oil is becoming more expensive. I do expect that uh, prices will be stable in the, around the levels that they are today, and uh, you can see this as well. Uh, we, we have gone in North America towards Shell Place because uh, easy oil is over and you need to go right. to new technologies. So Mexico's economy is growing at a higher rate than the United States, I think it's fair to say. So do you think you'll need to erect a wall to keep Americans from coming to Mexico looking for <laughs> jobs? Or... <laughs> the energy reform is the last piece, in my opinion, or one of the last pieces of North American integration. Uh, we liberalized trade, as you know, uh, through NAFTA. It has been extremely beneficial to the three countries. And energy uh, will be even more so. Uh, we, we foresee North America as an energy powerhouse uh, through what is happening in the Shell Revolution in the United States and Canada. And now with the changes in Mexico, energy production should go up, but not, not with the aim only to increase okay. production, but to have lower cheap uh, feedstock in order to fuel our economy. Okay. Aliko, how does it feel to, there are seven billion people on the face of the earth and you're one of the 100 most influential. So do your children respect you more with this title now? Do they treat you differently or you haven't noticed any great, greater respect by your children or anything? Or how does it feel to be one of the 100 most influential people in the world? Well, thank you, uh, David. I think uh, I feel normal. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, in the face of my children, I will still be the same person, you know, the same as you, I'm sure. Uh, uh, you well, my still children look at have me no the respect same. for me, but no. no <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you a more serious question, and that is this. Um, uh, all of a sudden, investors around the world act as if Sub-Saharan Africa was invented yesterday, and all of a sudden, people want to come into Sub-Saharan Af Sub Africa. It's been around for <clears throat> quite a while. Um, why do you think all of a sudden people want to invest in Sub-Saharan Africa? Well, uh, you know, the normal return on investment in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is about 30%. And uh, when 30, you look- 30, 30, zero? 30, yes, 30%. Uh, uh, you know, the issue is that we've been growing. If you look at even Africa as a whole, which really the driver is the Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we've been growing at about 5.5% in the last decade, at least 12 years. And apart from growing at 5.5%, when you look at it today, you need to also look at the future. Today, in uh, Africa, we are growing at 5.5%. 1 billion people and 1.85 trillion uh, in GDP. And going forward, if you look at it, even if we reduce by going at 4%, by 2050, the economy of uh, Africa will be uh, about nine trillion, which is equivalent to Japan and uh, you know China put together. And if we grow, we continue to grow at 5.5 percent, which I believe we should, right. because right now the 5.5 percent growth is actually growth without power. Because if you look at most of the countries in Africa, apart from uh, Ethiopia, really we lack power. 
And you know, definitely there's that saying that without power, there won't be any growth. Right. So with that, you now can say, okay, fine, if you continue at 5.5% 5 .5 by 2050, will be equivalent to the uh, economy of the United States, which is 15 trillion, with 2 billion people. Right. Because the population will double by 2050. Right, 800 million people <coughs> now in Sub-Saharan Africa, more or less. Yes, it's about 820. 820. 820. So when you look at it, uh, you know, you tend to say, okay, fine, well, why is it that people are not investing? Because majority of people, especially down here in the States, uh, people are still working on an archaic information, which is 1970 information about the GDP growth, about what is happening in the economy. I mean, when you look at companies like General Electric that truly believe in the sub-Saharan uh, you know, uh, uh, African region, uh, their sales of this first quarter of 2014 is equivalent to their total sales right. in uh, 2011. So if somebody wants to invest in sub-Saharan Africa and they don't know as much about it as you do, where would you recommend that they put their money? Which countries and which industries? <clears throat> I think the most driving uh, this thing is actually the uh, real driver is the western part of Africa and the eastern part of uh, you know, Africa. That's where really the growth you know, uh, uh, you know, are. When you look at West Africa, you're talking about Nigeria, you're talking about Ghana. And uh, you know, on the other side of East Africa, you're talking about Kenya, you're talking about Tanzania, and uh, Zambia. These five countries they really do uh, drive uh, you know the process. In your own country, Nigeria has now uh, surpassed South Africa as the largest GDP of any country in um, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but there have been some problems in northeastern Nigeria, some uh, revolts and other interruptions of uh, the economy. What do you think is the likely outcome of that? Are you worried as a businessman about the future of the country's uh, stability? Well, the future of the country's stability, I'm not really uh, worried about that, you know, because the government is doing quite a lot in terms of trying to stop the insurgency. And uh, as a business person, if I'm really worried or if there's any information that's there, I will be one of the first few to know about it or you know, at least to foresee something coming uh, because of our own uh, you know, size in uh, Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. But today, David, we're investing uh, you know, 12 billion in Nigeria alone and 4 billion outside Nigeria in other 16 different uh, countries. Uh, yes, it's true. When we look at it for our own business, the insurgency did not really reduce our own business. Our business uh, last year grew by 40% in terms of uh, revenue and in terms of profit, 46%. Okay. And your main business has historically been cement, is that? Yes, that's right. right. So I'm just curious, is, there, is the cement in Africa different than the cement in any other part of the world? Is the cement all the same? <laughs> is there different qualities of cement, it's all the same. Well, no, it is not so. When you look at it, for example, why are we investing heavily in uh, cement? Uh, when you look at it, really, uh, by 2007, uh, I think it was around 2005, we went to uh, you know, uh, IFC to did a package you know, for us, and that was our first uh, external uh, loan of $479 million. And we took the $479 million worth two years moratorium and also five years repayment period, but we paid back the loan in uh, 18 months. Okay, very good. Okay, that's what. Number two, when you look at uh, the demand, normally average demand per capita of uh, cement is 500 kg, even in uh, emerging markets. But in Africa, majority of the markets is about 100, 120. So it means that there's quite a lot of you know, uh, you know, prospect for growth. Today in Nigeria, we're just at about 125 uh, million, but we have 18 million housing deficit. So that's why we continue to invest. I mean, this year we're at 20 million tons. In the next six months, we'll be at 20. In another uh, two years, we'll be at about 65 million tons of, uh, you know, cement. Okay. So, Robert, um, when you picked a person who was running for President of the United States um, named Barack Obama, you got to know him. Uh, did you think he was actually going to make it when he was just a senator? And, and uh, when you play golf with him now, <laughs> and it's like a five-foot putt, do you just concede that to him, or do you make him putt those things out? 
You know, I, I love how everyone forgets I was president of UBS I'm before get this to that. president was president. <laughs> okay. So one of the, but before I begin, I, I literally I want to congratulate Chairman Ockberg for another great year at Exum, and I know the White House announced today their five-year and 160 reauthorization, and we hope, Fred, that you don't have to go through the same thing you went through last year, and it's a quicker approval right, process. Right, right. So. Uh, <laughs> I won't tell you that 32 advisors is counting on it, but we're counting on it. Um, so you, so well, you, were, you were president of UBS before he was president of the United States. Yeah. So have you given any advice on how to be a president? Listen, no. I, I think what's incredibly interesting is whether you listen to what um, Pemex is doing or Dungote companies, it's no different than what the United States needs to do. Everyone needs exports to increase, okay, manufacturing to grow. Everyone needs infrastructure around the world. We all know in the United States, we're all applauding ourselves that we just got promoted to a D plus on our recent civil engineering's report, which we all know isn't nearly where we're expected to be in the United States. But it's the fastest multiplier of GDP growth. And we all need, we know we need inbound investment in public-private partnerships. And when I think about what Mexico is doing and what Africa is doing, and obviously what the Exxon Bank is doing, and seeing that, you know, Carlisle just closed on their Africa fund, it says to me that this whole idea of breaking down barriers around the world is the future. And if you think about the three needs in the US, it's no different than the needs everywhere else. So, you know, I would say when you look at the president's policies and you look at his export initiative, which I'm on his council, uh, that he's had for a while to double exports because we're one of the lowest industrialized company, countries in the world for exports, or you listen at his need for an infrastructure bank, or you listen to the idea of that he began Select USA, um, a few years back to help foreign direct investment. It is no different than when I speak to our clients around the world what they're trying to do. So I think policies of growth is what we need all around the world. We need to get education going, we need to get employment up, and we need to get infrastructure going. So I think uh, you know, if we just think about what the leaders around the world are trying to do, it's, it's not that dissimilar. So I, I think he's been ahead of the game there. I think it's obviously been a struggle to get things approved. The idea that we don't have an infrastructure bill approved in this country is despicable, uh, considering what needs we have. I think we have something like three and a half trillion dollars of public-private partnership needs just in this country alone. So, you know, yes, I give him the putt if it's a five-footer. No, he doesn't give me the putt, okay? okay? <laughs> and, uh, and yes, we've been talking, you know, since he was uh, then senator. And yes, I always thought he had the chance to be president, uh, which is why I was one of the first ones on board. But when I went on board, I think he was running 10th in Iowa, right behind Kucinich. So oh. it, was a, it was one of the best trades I've ever done. Okay. All right. <laughs> David, um, you covered uh, the Federal Reserve for quite a while. And in fact, you wrote a very uh, well-known book, a bestseller about uh, Ben Bernanke's uh, um, leadership at the Fed. Now Ben Bernanke is at Brookings and he's working for you. So how does that feel to be Ben Bernanke's boss? Well, I always figured that if you have people working for you who are smarter than you, you're ahead of the game and I succeeded. Uh, ben Bernanke showed up for work on the Monday after the Friday where his term was finished. Uh, there was a bit of a flurry at Brookings because they had sent him a, a pass for the parking garage. They sent it over to the Fed on Friday and the Fed lost it. So there was worry that he wouldn't be able to get his car into the garage. And he came in, he was wearing a blue button-down shirt and khakis, and he said to me, I wasn't sure what the dress code here was. And I assured him it was whatever he wants. Um, uh, uh, Has he been a good employee so far? He's or? been a very good employee. I have to admit that I still haven't quite used to the fact that I'm sitting at my computer typing away, and I hear someone at the door to my office, and it's Ben Bernanke saying, you do anything for lunch? Um, <laughs> But, but seriously, I, I really admire the guy. Uh, he stepped down as chairman of the Fed. He, has, uh, he doesn't seem to have the need to have any of the trappings of power. He doesn't seem to miss having the security guys around. He comes to work every day. He's working on a book, as you know. Uh, Barb Barnett is still uh, in the process of selling it. I don't think he'll have a problem. And I think he's, uh, it'll be a fascinating book to read because here's a guy who spent his entire academic career studying the Great Depression which seemed like a nice historical curiosity, something like studying dinosaurs. And then he, by total coincidence, is chairman of the Fed when a brontosaurus rex appears on the horizon. And so the fact that he had this understanding of what happened during the Depression, 
about why it was so bad for the country that banks failed and clogged the arteries of the economy so informed his, his leadership during the crisis that I, I'm really fascinated by how he reflects on that. So um, President Obama, I think, uh, considered uh, having Larry Summers as a replacement for Ben Bernanke. I don't think that's a secret. Um, how do you think the Fed would be different today, if at all, if Larry Summers was there instead of Janet Yellen? It would be a hell of a lot more fun for reporters to cover if Larry Summers <laughs> was the Fed chairman. Um, actually, President Obama considered appointing Larry Summers when uh, Bernanke's term, first term was up, and in part because of Tim Geithner's advice, decided that having continuity during the crisis was a better thing. And then I think he wanted to appoint Larry Summers as Fed chairman the second time, but he discovered that um, one thing that Larry Summers did was unite Republicans and Democrats in the Senate <laughs> to say they wanted somebody else. Um, I think Yellen will be very much uh, Bernanke 2.0, uh, that we'll get continuity. She was there for many of the policies. She may be a little more uh, worried about unemployment than even the modern Bernanke was. I think Summers would have been uh, two things. One is I don't think he would have been of nearly, I, don't think, I think the caricature of Summers was wrong. I don't think he would have been particularly friendly to the banks, and I don't think he would have been at all reluctant to use expansionary right. policy. But I do think he would have been unpredictable. He would have felt a need to break the paradigm, and that might make people a little nervous. Okay, so you might have a chance here to move markets. Tell us when you think Janet Yellen is going to increase interest rates. <laughs> if I answer that, will you answer it too? <laughs> I'll give you my guess, but go ahead. You're, you're more informed. <laughs> Second half of 2015. Second What's half. your guess? I would say as soon as she thinks the unemployment rate is really much stable, around 6.5%, 6.6, I think, and she thinks it's going to not go above that, I think that's probably likely. Um, but I don't think she's going to rush to do it, honestly. Really? So you agree? OK. So let me ask um, Emilio a um, question about Latin America. Um, Mexico is often thought by the United States to be part of Latin America. But when you go down to Brazil or Argentina, they don't really have much to do with the Mexican economy. So do you consider yourself more closely tied with Latin American economies in Mexico, or more closely tied with the United States? No, in Mexico, we clearly see each other as part of both. <laughs> uh, and first, in terms of integration of our economy, North America has been the driver of exports over the last 20 years through NAFTA. But uh, under the leadership also of President Peña, we have recently closed a trade agreement with Colombia, Chile, and Peru, which accounts for 40% of Latin America's GDP. This integration pact called the Pacific Alliance, because it's all the countries on the Pacific coast, uh, means that 90, uh, more than 95% of total trade has zero tariffs. There is full... Um, capabilities for workers to go and work in other right. places, and full integration of the financial markets. So uh, today, Mexico has a foot on both sides, and uh, this has no political aims by any means. We just want growth to happen. We believe integration is good. Uh, Mexico is one of the l most open economies in the world. We believe in the principles of, uh, of free trade, and therefore we are also pushing for other packs like TPP actively. Now, other countries uh, that have had energy companies like Pemex have ultimately deregulated them and let them go invest in other countries. So do you see Pemex becoming an investor in energy around the world, or are you going to stick to Mexico? Well, right now, the low-hanging fruit is uh, in Mexico. We have abundant reserves. Uh, we believe in the North American energy concept. Look at what, what is happening in the United States. And investing in Mexico in energy, uh, there, there are many ways. Number one, many ways to see it as a profit investment. Number one, uh, there are many reserves that are accessible compared to other parts of the world. Number two, we have talent. Pemex has been in business for 76 years, and there's a lot of talent as well in the United States and companies that could come in and develop Mexican reserves. And third is we have infrastructure. We have pipelines throughout Mexico, 80,000 kilometers, so for any oil company to come and invest in Mexico, it is easier because you don't have to lay out all right. the infrastructure, so it is, it is cheaper. That does not mean that Pemex does, will not go international at some point. But right now, the, the easier opportunities for us are uh, in Mexico. Now, um, one of the issues that Mexico and the United States have been divided on over recent years is immigration. 
And as a business leader, uh, is that a major concern for you if the United States resolves or doesn't resolve immigration by some legislation? Do you care that much about it or it's not a major focus for you? We believe uh, that an immigration reform in the United States is positive for the United States, but uh, this is something that the United States has to deal in its own terms. We're very respectful of that. But uh, as a business leader, what I believe what we have to do is to look at ways to reduce immigration and we have some very good ideas. Uh, look at what's happening with natural gas in the United States. It has made uh, the industry much more competitive through various infrastructure projects that we're building, in particular pipelines connecting the United States and Mexico. We will have abundant natural gas in Mexico. Just to give you an idea what it will uh, mean for Pemex, that means that we will go from consuming 6% of the total electricity demand in Mexico to produce about 15% of it. How, how does this happen? We will shift from uh, using fuel oil, which is much more expensive, and utilize natural right. gas. So the impact on the economy will be great. And when you ask me about immigration, why, why am I talking about natural gas and immigration? Well, if Pemex, together with partners, builds some energy infrastructure to bring this cheap feedstock to Central America, we will create economic opportunities in Central right. America. Henry Hub prices, which is the reference price in the, in the United States for gas, is about $4.50. You know how much they're paying in Central America? More than $20. There is no way that they can create economic development down there with these high energy costs. If we work together on this, bringing cheaper electricity and gas to, to Central America, we will reduce immigration. Now, what about telecommunications deregulation? That's not your area of expertise, but give us your insights. Um, there are some people that say that prices are higher in telecommunications in Mexico because it hasn't been that deregulated. Do you expect some deregulation to occur? It happened. One of the 16 reforms that I was mentioning to you was a telecom bill. It was passed as a, at the constitutional level right. last year, and it is being discussed this week at the secondary law uh, level. It will change the landscape drastically, and it will create much more competition, uh, which uh, the natural effect will be cheaper prices for the consumer. Okay. So in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Eliko, let me ask you a question. Uh, very often Americans look at uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and they invest some, but they don't, they're not probably the leading investors there. My impression is that people from China or Japan or the Middle East or Europe are well ahead of Americans there. But as you see foreign business people coming into Nigeria or other parts of Sub-Saharan Af Sub Africa, who do you see as being the most aggressive and the people who are really doing the most creative things in Sub-Saharan Africa? Where are they from? Well, I think uh, normally from uh, Asia. Um, China normally targets the uh, natural resources uh, where they heavily uh, you know, look at investing in terms of maybe iron or coal, just you know, for their own security, but not really that they establish factories there in uh, Africa. Uh, in the sub-Saharan Africa, when you look at it, I think the Europeans are much more, uh, you know, aggressive in terms of, uh, you know, investing. Uh, the only uh, people that are lagging behind, I think, are the Americans. Like what I said, that uh, they haven't really, you know, updated the, you know, information in terms of what is happening in the region. Uh, but, you know, looking at it really right now, almost everybody has put sub-Saharan Africa on their searchlight. Right. Uh, you know, because there are quite a lot of things that are happening and, uh, you know, people are uh, investing heavily. Now, one of the issues in emerging market investments that people often talk about is the concerns about corruption. And in Nigeria, there was a report from the Nigerian government, I think it was, the central bank, saying that seems to be a lot of money was missing from the... Uh, that had come in oil reserve, oil revenues had come in and it seems to be missing. So is that a big issue in Nigeria now, the oil money that seems to be missing? And how do you, one deal with so-called corruption issues in sub-Saharan Africa? How do you deal with them when you go to a, a country that's not your own country? How do you deal with these problems? Well, normally what we deal in the area that our company invests, uh, you know, we uh, were in a different uh, area, you know, in Nigeria we invest in, you know, in uh, oil, in, uh, you know, uh, food, in cement, but outside Nigeria we only do <coughs> cement, so we really don't have much issues. Uh, yes, corruption is there, definitely, but corruption doesn't also stop business. The only thing that you need to do is not to participate. By you not participating, then it will reduce the number of people 
uh, corrupting uh, government officials. I mean, talking about the missing money, uh, which we just mentioned in uh, you know Nigeria, I think they have already set off uh, you know a firm to audit what was missing. You know, was it really missing uh, amount of money, or was it uh, you know in terms of numbers? You know, uh, you know, which I believe is going to come out very soon. So very often when people make a lot of money in, let's say, one part of the world, they decide to diversify and invest in other parts of the world. But you seem to be focused mostly in investing in sub-Saharan Africa, which is the area you know. Why don't you say, I'll invest some of my money in the United States or Europe or Asia? Why are you still focused principally in sub-Saharan Africa? Well, yes, we, we feel that uh, there are more opportunities there. You know, uh, right now when you look at it, um, if we are not going to invest as a company in Sub-Saharan Africa, the only other area for us to invest, you know, is maybe United States of America. And I think uh, for now, we are much, much better off to invest because there's quite a lot of need uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. You know, I mean, we need massive uh, terms of investment in infrastructure, which we're also involved in, which is power generation. And then we also want to do uh, a lot of cement. We are doing refineries. Let me give you an example of the opportunities that we have. Take a place like uh, Nigeria. Uh, in Nigeria, really, we are only agriculture is contributing more in terms of GDP. I think it's now after rebasing of the GDP at about five hundred and ten billion dollars. Agriculture is about twenty three percent. But even with this, we are losing less than 7% of our arable land in agriculture. So that's quite a lot. Nigeria alone imports about 1.5 million tons of sugar from Brazil alone. And we have the land, we have the resources you know, to grow most of this. So what we are trying to do right now is actually invest as much as possible in Africa. Right? Like right now, when we look at it, the only working refinery in, uh, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, good refinery working, they are in two places. One is in South Africa. The other one is a small one, 70,000 uh, you know, barrels per day in uh, Cote d'Ivoire. And that's why we decided now to actually build 400,000 barrels per day refinery in Nigeria. Uh, because you know 90% of Nigeria's consumption is imported. So we export the crude and we import the finished product, you know, I mean, which does not really make any sense. So you are a leader in trying to eradicate polio in your country, where it's one of the few countries that still has polio in Africa. Uh, why did you decide to get involved in that issue? And was Bill Gates influential in your thinking, or you did this without anything from Bill Gates? No, no, no. I, actually, you know, it wasn't Bill Gates. Uh, this, you know, I've had uh, our foundation was uh, registered in uh, February 1993. So, and I think at that time, Before really, Bill Gates didn't even do any foundation yet. And uh, we've been actually doing quite a lot. And think health is one of the areas that we concentrate on. And when Bill Gates uh, was having issues, especially in uh, Kano, where I come from, we now partner ourselves, Bill and Melinda Foundation, and then the state government, which is now working extremely well. If you look at uh, his own report, is that since when we got involved, the uh, polio thing has actually drastically been going down. And we are going to actually you know, go and work with him in other states to make sure that we eradicate uh, polio in the next two years. Okay. Bob, you were a great trader for many years at Salomon and at UBS, so just give us a little advice. Um, should we be getting out of bonds because interest rates are going to be going up, and when should we be doing that? Interesting. Well, I would agree that we probably won't see a rising rate environment uh, before the second half of 15, um, and it could even be further out the curve than that. Um, it feels to me that all the asset classes right now feel a bit toppy, uh, whether it's the equity markets, the bond markets, the housing markets. But when you have rates at zero, people are not necessarily interested in putting their cash under the bed, so they reach for yield. And so it's not surprising to me that the, the high yield market is on wildfire. It's not surprising to me the private equity market's on wildfire, and that, that there seems to be some uh, opportunities that over the last five years people would say, hmm, it seems a little frothy. But we could all surprise ourselves, and it can continue to run because there's so much money chasing it. 
I'm glad I'm not trading anymore because everything is so transparent nowadays. <laughs> we don't have that advantage <laughs> from my old Solomon brother days. But so, um, so you think WhatsApp <laughs> is worth nineteen billion dollars? You think that's toppy or not? You know, I, you know, I miss Twitter. I miss Facebook. I'm not on LinkedIn, so I'm probably not the best to to ask. Although I did start do this startup recently. You know, it, it feels to me that people are, are, are chasing, you know, the whole idea of how do you reach the consumer. Uh, and this new technological revolution we're having, the best way to reach them is through digital media and, and mobile. So, no, I'm not really uh, surprised. I'm probably surprised that something's worth $19 billion that we never heard about until a few months ago. But I, I'm not surprised that you're seeing some of these people reach for these growth engines and using it with stock. Remember, you know, it's not like they're paying cash for it. They're using what we think is their frothy stock price to buy something else at a frothy stock price. So, I mean, you could argue, I mean, I think Facebook came out with their earnings and they look like they're probably going to be one of the fastest advertising companies in the world. Uh, and so, it, you know, maybe it does make sense. They have now another 450 million users by WhatsApp. Well, you may be uh, more technologically savvy than me because uh, when my uh, daughter was at Harvard, undergrad, she met a young man who's now her husband. He wanted to introduce me to his classmate from Phillips Exeter, who was leaving Harvard to start a company. It was called Facebook. I read it, and I said, that will never get anywhere. And, so, <laughs> and then recently, uh, in Davos, Bill Gates and I were hosting something for the Giving Pledge to entice people to sign the Giving Pledge. And he said, would you mind if I uh, invite somebody who's not likely to give right away, but he's probably going to be worth a fair amount of money soon. He's only 32 years old. And I said, well, what's his company? Who is he? He said he started a company called Airbnb, which I'd never heard of, of course. And then he, the kid came, and he's 32 years old, started the company three years ago. Now I've just been valued at $10 billion. So uh, I am the last person to know about some of these things as well. But anyway, so today, um, if you were uh, recommending to people, let's say here, what they should do with their money, uh, what would you recommend? Where do you invest your money? You know, as uh, someone who feels fortunate that I've been on Wall Street for 30 years, I am incredibly uh, conservative. So I'm buying munis, and I have a ladder, and I just hope to keep the money I made. But now what I'm doing with my money is I'm building 32 advisors. So I'm trying to do what you all did, you know, many years ago, doing something entrepreneurial that I never have done. And as I said to Fred this morning, it's, it's humbling, it's hard. It's liberating, but it's incredibly exciting. And you know, w when I graduated from Wharton at 21, I never thought I'd turn around and I'm 50 and I've done one thing my whole life. So leaving Wall Street to do something entre entrepreneurial has been a, a very exciting stage for me. But, but you know, there's something to say for a big company that has a lot of the resources and, and, and provides you a lot of the things. But you know, when you listen to the people on stage here today and, and the people prior to us, there's such opportunity around the world that we're not familiar with. I mean, you know, I've been studying, you know, the last few months Sub-Saharan Africa as our company is, is doing some cross-border advisory work there. And yes, I've had my polio shot, my malaria, my typhoid, my yellow fever, <laughs> and all the other great things I've recently taken. But what's interesting to me is when you do some of the diligence, you realize that actually the script is much better um, than the cover. So in, in the US, and I heard you said it about Russia in years past, one of the reasons you always nervous, David, about Russia was rule of law and geopolitical risk. And we think about often sub-Sahara Africa with the corruption and the geo geopolitical risk or the, the trafficking that may go on. But I think what we actually could think about is as the, this country continues to grow, which it's growing so fast, this, these countries will change dramatically as well, and their health care as a percent of GDP will go from one to five, maybe not 20 like this country, but it will continue to increase. And the cost of, and the amount of education they're doing will go from 1% to 10%. And as people like what Aliko is doing in Nigeria and around the continent, listen, there's nothing more important than people making money and people getting education. And I think that as Sub-Saharan Africa continues to thrive in, in its very immature stage, I think you're going to see an abundance of, of growth opportunity there. And I think people will then feel less concerned about putting private money into that uh, environment.
And if the president said he'd like you to be a full-time employee of the federal government as an ambassador or a cabinet <laughs> officer, your response would be? Would be no. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. Like it has been for a while. Okay. All right. So you've turned down things. Okay. And are you a better golfer than he is? No. Uh, yeah, are we, someone course. said we're on TV here. Right, okay. He's a right. great golfer. He's a great golfer. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he has a ten, uh, he's a, what, a zero handicap? Uh, no, no, but he, he, he's actually improved much more than I have over the last few years. Okay, very good. He's probably done more practice. Exactly. Right, okay. All right, so let me ask you this. The, the Congress sometimes says, David, that they ought to audit the Federal Reserve because the Federal Reserve is a little opaque. And do you think the Federal Reserve would benefit from an audit done by the Congress or done by somebody on the behalf of the Congress? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, look, the Congress has done such a great job with fiscal policy that they're looking right. to diversify into monetary policy. <laughs> uh, uh, audit, audit the Fed sounds good, but it's not like Price Waterhouse. It's like members of Congress saying, oh, you should have done 590 billion of QE, or you should raise, have rates rates sooner. Um, I think that the Fed has a particularly difficult challenge. It's a fundamentally anti-democratic institution, technocrats whose power was exposed during the crisis. And it's difficult to make the case that this is a legitimate thing in a democracy. But most, all really big capitalist democracies have decided that if you let the politicians uh, control the money supply, you end up with more inflation than you'd like in the long run. Uh, so I don't think it's going anywhere. I think Congress is too wise for that. But can I pick up on your last question okay. uh, uh, to Bob? I think that uh, if you look at the world from the point of view of the American worker, or the American middle class, this whole discussion is a little bit scary. Uh, that we have good reason to believe that we're going to have much more competition, whether it's from Africa, Latin America, or Asia. We've been through a period of time where the US economy really doesn't seem to have delivered for ordinary workers. Uh, partly we had this horrible uh, recession, and then, but even before then, the trends of slow growth and widening inequality have been really unsettling to people. And so I think there's a, um, I think there's a need to think about what are the things we need to do in the United States so ordinary voters, middle class people feel like their kids have a chance of doing better than they well, are. Let's talk about that for a moment. Um, can, ahead, can I just add to that? I think the one thing we need to be careful about, and this is something that you know, we think is a great opportunity, and it's breaking down these barriers, but um, in September 11, 2001, a disproportionate amount of foreign direct investment came into this country. We were number one in the world without a close second. Over the last 10 years, or actually now 12 years, because of protectionism, lack of immigration reform, labor arbitrage, over-regulation, we are no longer the powerhouse for inbound investment. China has overtaken us, Brazil and Mexico are on our heels, Canada's on our heels, and we've lost about 50% of our market share. So I would say that, you know, where there's nervousness about the barriers being open, I think we need to continue to have more free trade, we continue to have to, we have to continue to have, reduce our barriers, because I think actually that's where right. business gets done. It gets done around the world 24-7, and I think we've missed that over the last decade. Yes, Emilio. David, let me add to that. For example, many of the reforms that Mexico is carrying out means opportunities for American jobs. Uh, the opening up of the sector, uh, of the energy sector, means you know, the hundreds of companies that are drilling right. in, in the United States could come to Mexico and create jobs in the United States. This is why we work with the Exim Bank on many fronts. Another area for opportunity is, uh, I mean, Mexican exports to the United States mean as well jobs in the United States. About 50 cents of every dollar that we export to the United States right. is, uh, has a value added generated in the United States. So I fully agree with you. It means bringing down barriers, something that we've discussed here, means greater prosperity for the world. No? And, and, for, and, and for American jobs. In the end, who do you think was the greater beneficiary of NAFTA, Mexico or the United States? I think it's hard to say. I think both. No? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. That's a very diplomatic answer. Okay. <laughs> David, um, normally when you go into a recession, it, you kind of, when you're out of the recession, they usually they end in about nine months. This one took a lot longer. You get back to the unemployment rate uh, that you had before the recession, about two years or so after the recession ends. But we still don't have that unemployment rate. Do you think we are locked into 
a 6 percent plus unemployment rate for the foreseeable future in the United States? I don't. I think it's been incredibly painful, this slow recovery process, but we are healing. We're out of intensive care, but we're not yet back to where we were. I think the danger is that the longer it takes to get unemployment down, the more we're creating this large number of people, many of them middle-aged men, who have been out of work so long that they'll never go back to work. And that's why there's a certain impatience, I think, with the fiscal policy we pursued, contractionary right. too early, uh, because we, if, we, if we wait too long, we will be in a permanent. Explain this to people here who may not be from the United States. We have roughly $18 trillion of debt, not counting the $60 trillion of unfunded Medicare, Social Security liabilities, but it's like $18 trillion of debt, roughly 100% of GDP, more or less. That counts the money in the Social Security Trust Fund. Yes, yeah, okay, right. so external, internal debt, $18 trillion. Right. Why is nobody in Capitol Hill worried about that anymore? They, you know, uh, Bowles Simpson is gone, nobody cares about it, the deficit has come down to only $500 billion a year, which is set to be such a great thing. Why does nobody talk about the debt anymore? I think two reasons. One is, uh, as we know, politicians are short-sighted, and when the, uh, the current year debt falls abruptly, they kind of breathe a sigh of relief. Secondly, many of the arguments for dealing with the debt have to do with, oh, if we don't deal with the debt, um, we'll have higher interest rates. Well, that doesn't seem imminent. Or we'll have a financial market crisis, and we'll people pre predicting that for about three years, and that doesn't arrive. And the third thing is, politicians don't like to uh, define their goals as things they can't achieve. And when they tried to make deficit reduction a, a prime objective, they failed miserably. And so now they've decided to define the problem as something now, else. Now, you know Congress pretty well, as, as well as the Fed. Uh, you, do you see any more government shutdowns and uh, efforts to basically not pay the U.S. debt on time? I don't see more efforts uh, either one. I think uh, uh, the Republicans have learned that when you shut the government or threaten to default, you hurt yourselves as much okay. as you do the other side. Now, when you go out and, let's say, have a drink with Ben Bernanke, and maybe he drinks a few drinks, and he's feeling, you know, very willing to tell you his I've never gone drinking with Ben Bernanke. Uh, well, <laughs> just uh, we'll have a lunch with him. And his innermost secrets, will he tell you that he thinks maybe they should have bailed out Lehman Brothers? Does he ever say that? No. Um, he has his story on Lehman Brothers, and he's sticking to it. Okay. Both, uh, or Ben Bernanke, Hank Paulson, and Tim Geithner, at the moment that Lehman failed, had lots of explanations for why they were doing it, including it was time to wean Wall Street off. I was of the there that three-day weekend in that room. I so it's your you, fault. Some of the things you hear are you not necessarily them? some you of the things that took place in that room. But, but I think, I mean, it's really interesting to remember that if you read the newspapers the day that Lehman went under, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times editorial page, they were applauding. After the fact, Paulson, Bernanke, and Geithner, particularly Paulson and Bernanke, have landed on one explanation. We did not have the legal authority to prevent Lehman from failing. But you agree with that? Uh, it's a little hard for me to accept that the Fed had the power to do almost anything it wanted every other day of the crisis except that one day. Okay. And what, was it, what was it like in that, little, that room? What was it like in that room? Were they... Uh... Were they drinking a lot, or they yeah, weren't drinking? I mean, it was, a lot one of of, it was one of the most surreal three days of my life. We got called down and said, come down to the Fed at 4 o'clock. There was about tw 10 of us in the room. And they walked in and said, we have till Sunday night to save Lehman. We have to figure it out, a private sector solution. I would agree that their perspective is that they did not have the regulatory authority. They walked in and they said, you know, you had the Fed, the SEC, and obviously the Treasury. and there, there was a feeling like by Sunday they really couldn't uh, have the repo ready and the counterparty risk of Lehman without some sort of serious contagion. I think the, 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 the most interesting thing was, you know, considering UBS ourselves was in our own situation, um, is that no one really could discuss AIG during that meeting. That's where we didn't have the real regulatory capability. They were really the big elephant in the room that couldn't be discussed. And I think which is why the regulatory reform and having a systemic regulator is so critical. We'll never go into a meeting where we can't discuss, okay, the entire financial services system. And I'm not saying too big to fail is end. I'm just saying we do have better tools today than we had then. In the emerging markets, very often inflation is a concern. And I don't know, are you worried about inflation right now in Nigeria? No, well, uh, I'm not really worried about inflation because uh, inflation last year were as high as about 12%. We're down to 7% now. 7%. No, 7, seven. now. 
know. Yeah, last okay. year was high, but we are down to uh, seven. Uh, the only thing that we are really more worried about is interest rate and also availability of uh, funding. Okay. Uh, interest rate is a little bit uh, high, so you know, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa on average. Now, is inflation a problem in Mexico or not so much? We do not uh, see that as a problem. We have a fully independent central bank, okay. and inflation is uh, under, under the um, uh, band that the central bank has uh, envisioned it. And uh, actually, our challenge is, just as in, in Nigeria, is to increase financing. Right. Uh, a reform has been passed to increase financing from about 23% of GDP to hopefully levels closer right. to, our, to 50%. Is the Fed worried about inflation? Um, it seems to be not a big problem, but uh, maybe if we had a little bit more inflation, would it be good? Well, the Fed thinks so. The Fed has set a 2% inflation target, and they're having trouble getting it to 2%. The European Central Bank is having I even see. more trouble. I think there are some people on the Fed's policy committee that are uneasy. They expect it to show up any day now, but Janet Yellen said in a speech the other day that she was more worried about deflation than inflation. Right. I don't think that means she's predicting it, but I think it tells you where she's well, When I was in government, I managed to get inflation to 19%. And so maybe I, you should go back. You could help. I'd be willing to go back and teach them how to do it. It's not that hard, but okay. Um, so um, if let's suppose you were all just a private equity investor, and somebody came along to you and said, here is a $100 million that you can invest anywhere in the world over the next five years. Do whatever you want with it. Just get the highest rate of return and don't lose your money. Where would you put that $100 million, other than Mexico Energy? <laughs> Any place? I, I think Mexico Energy. Mexico <laughs> Energy, OK. <laughs> and you put it in uh, Nigerian cement, or no? No, I think I put it in Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa. Yes. Robert, you put it? Well, this is easy for me. I would put a third in Carlisle. <laughs> okay. I would absolutely. Why only put a, a third? <laughs> no, no, because I would absolutely put a third in the deregulatory okay. environment right. of energy in Mexico. And then easily, with 30% returns in, in Nigeria and Africa, I'd absolutely put the last third in there. <laughs> okay. So, you should put all of it. And right. so then that would, that's just easy for me. Give right. me the 100 million first. All right. Well, I'm not in this league. You, you wouldn't, all right, I wouldn't. I suppose I give you a million dollars. In the, the Brookings Institution, of course. Okay. But what about you? If you weren't investing in Carlisle, where would you put your 10 million? Well, the key to in. If you have money, the key is not to lose it. So I, I think people should take relatively modest risks and seek relatively modest returns. The, uh, when you think you're an investment genius and you go for spectacular returns, you often lose money. So I think the key to I I investing is diversification. So I, I wouldn't put it in any one place because I think no one place you can predict is necessarily going to be very good. So I, I would do you know, some fixed income, some um, equities, and obviously some private equity, of course. But you have a different idea? No, I, something that has been raised here, and, and I believe is key, is the infrastructure needs in the world, including the United States, are huge. And there are tremendous sums of money being right. parked in very low uh, returns, fixed income, that could be channeled right. uh, to you know, promote greater, greater prosperity. The multiplier effect of infrastructure in the world is huge. And this applies, I believe, for emerging markets and uh, developed markets. Well, business people have responsibilities other than making profits. I think people recognize that you just can't do anything to make profits. So suppose I gave you $100 million to give away for, to, to solve some social problem in your country or your region. What would you do with $100 million? You had to give it away. We invest heavily in education. Uh, the money that uh, we give away, I mean, it's state money, but that we give directly to institutions is mostly focused on education, uh, just as, uh, as many of you who are in this panel do. Uh, we'll invest in education, health, and also empowerment. Okay. Well, it's easy. My wife works for the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Human Rights and Social okay. Justice. so. I'd probably start with that and, and, uh, and then obviously with children and education. Okay, David? I think I'd invest in uh, young black African American men. I think when you look at the data, the number of young African American men who get in trouble and never make it to anything regarding a stable family or the American middle class is going to hurt us in the end. A lot of that has to do with education, but not all of it. Okay, so let me ask each of you very quickly, what is the biggest concern you have today about the state of the world? What are, you know, as you look at the world, you're a citizen of the world, what are you most worried about? What keeps you up at night, or what do you think the world should worry more about than they're worrying about? I'm worried about uh, the availability 
of uh, talented people for this industry and in general for industries that are driving growth, just like technology companies, but in the case of energy, I mean, we fuel growth and, and we, I clearly see bottlenecks in uh, several industries, including uh, the energy sector, where uh, not only one company uh, will solve it, we need to collaborate on, on, on facilitating uh, the right investment in education. Okay. Well, I think mine is uh, youth unemployment. And I think you know that's one of the things that really gives youth me quite a lot of uh, worry. Yes. What's the youth unemployment rate in, let's say, Nigeria? Very high, double digits. Well, you know, uh, in Nigeria, when you look at like sub-Saharan Africa, you know, 60% of our population they are all below the age of 25, and you know there are quite a lot of them that really uh, they are jobless, and that's really what caused the crisis of uh, North Africa. You know, the uprising, you know, was okay. actually started by uh, youth, uh, unemployed youth. So I think really it's one of the key challenges that we have in uh, mainly Africa. But it is a problem all over the world. And Robert, I can't, go ahead. I would say skills training because we have a pretty negative barbell. We have an aging population that don't have the skills really for today's society. And we have a, a young population who aren't really getting the skills in science, technology, and math. And so... I would say that uh, I'm very nervous about you know, how we are teaching education around the world and making them prepared for, for uh, their next employment. So you were very prescient in picking the next president of the United States uh, years ago. Can you tell everybody here who the next president of the United States will be? Uh, I'm staying out of that until at least after the midterm. Okay. <laughs> All right. And David? Uh... I think uh, I worry that the developed world is set settling for too little growth, that we could have more growth if we put our mind to it and that the growth that we do have is increasingly unevenly distributed and that the inequality thing is going to come back and bite us right. on the butt. Final question. What is the most important agency of the federal government? Everybody know? <laughs> Export Import Bank? Export Import Bank? I mean, everybody agree on that? Yes, exit. No. All right. Well, thank you all very much for a very interesting panel. Thank you. <clears throat>